Listen up. This is the Construction Mentor Podcast. My name is Ike. I am your host. You can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, at the Construction Mentor. What are we here to do? We're here to educate people about opportunities in the construction industry. Today, we have a guest that will talk about my number one trade. I would say that I always recommend to people when they're thinking about getting into the industry simply because there's not enough people to do it. This is the furthest guest that I've ever had on the show. I'm doing this from Florida and my guest, Ray Michaels, is coming from Hawaii. So it's the afternoon here. It is the morning there. Mike, Ray, how are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks, Ike. Thanks for having me on. Very excited to be here with you and talk about the industry and I think the all the opportunities that are available for people right now. So you can follow any Ray's content and his company's content. He's the president at of Maui Plumbing. It's at Maui Plumbing Inc., right? Is that the handle on Instagram? It's at Maui underscore plumbing on Instagram. At Maui underscore plumbing. Now, where I came from, it did not look that pretty to be in the trades. When I, when I grew up in Boston, being a plumber, the scenery isn't that good. Some of the backgrounds and some of the posts that you have, I was just looking at are like absolutely gorgeous. It's what you think about when you know you, you think about Hawaii, right? It's not all blue skirts and hotels there. There's somebody that has to put this stuff together. So you've been in the industry there from day one, right? Like you grew up in the, in the industry? Yeah, my father was a plumber. So my father moved out to Hawaii in the 70s because he was a surfer. He was living in, uh, in Los Angeles and there wasn't a lot of work opportunities for him there. And so uh, he got offered a position as a boiler maker's apprentice. And so he moved out to Hawaii with the surfboard and Harley Davidson and was doing boiler making and then got recru- recruited into local 675. So the local plumber fitters and steam fitters union. And that's where he did his apprenticeship. And then I was born in 85. And then, you know, as soon as I could, you know, I was riding around with dad and his truck, you know, grabbing fittings and organizing materials. So, yeah, kind of grew up in the trade. And funny enough, it's not something I thought I would do as a career. I always thought I'd be in IT because I was good with computers, but quickly discovered that I liked being outside much better than I liked being in an office. Although here I am, you know, almost 40 and most of the time I'm in an office, but still got that tangible skill that I is, I find to be invaluable and so thankful for. I mean, a lot of people, I try to hammer the point home, you know, just because you're a plumber doesn't mean that you're... You know, you got your butt crack sticking out while your head is underneath the sink all the time. Right? You, you, there is a business, right? And I don't think that there's a better skill that can allow you to become your own entrepreneur. You yeah, and I, are the president, right? So is that your company? Did you inherit that company? How'd you, how'd you start that? I started the business in 2010. I was working for my dad at the time and I had a lot of different ideas of how I wanted to see the industry grow. One of the things I like to tell people is like, I loved my job, but I hated the industry, or at least I hated the stereotypes surrounding the industry. So like you had just said, you know, as a plumber, people think of somebody who is dirty um, and he's got his butt crack hanging out and he's, he's kind of abrasive. And I thought, man, we have the most important job in society. We, you know, I saw this American standard poster where it's this plumber and he's in overalls and he's standing in the world and says the plumber protects the health of the nation, which is completely true. I think plumbers save more lives in the entire medical field. So I really wanted to rupture those stereotypes. And so I was telling my dad, I go, you know, we should kind of embrace more technology. And he's an old school guy. I mean, typical baby boomer, right? And nothing, Mm -hmm. I have nothing disparaging to say about my father and the way he ran things, but everything was done, you know, very much on paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nothing was digital. And I thought if you could blend technology with the trades, you might actually get a lot more efficiency and you might get some interest from the younger generations as well. And we kind of started to butt heads on the direction we wanted to take the company goes, you know what, I think it'd be better if you just started your own company. (laughs) And so he gave me my blessing. And so I started in 2010. It was just me. I bought a 2001 F350 off of eBay for $8,000, sold my Toyota Tacoma for it. And that's how I started. And now we are at about 65 people in the company. And my role is business development, community outreach, sales and marketing, right? And I do a lot of things working with policymakers to try and bring more people into the trades and more vocational training in schools. So you're not even close to being in the field anymore, although you could probably strap strap on the tools if you had to, right? Yeah, you know, I still carry uh, tools in my truck, and I don't know if it's a comfort blanket type of thing, but, you know, I have a superintendent who uh, does the same thing, although neither of us have turned wrench in years. But You're always ready to go, though. 
yeah, there's something about that and having the tools with you. You just feel like, you know, capable, right? right? So let me ask you this. Number one, you're hundred percent right with technology. I had another person on who runs a landscaping company and he talked about how he was able to leverage Jobber, you know, the app to dispatch his guys, to do estimates. He actually didn't even own a computer until a week ago and he runs a landscaping company with 35 people, right? So when I, I, I explain to people like, you don't have to be a tech guy, but if, if the industry is at equilibrium, oftentimes we're struggling and managing by crisis just to, just to keep our head above water. What the technology allows you to do is it allows you to get more proactive, proficient, profitable, right? Now, would you, you just described your job position and it was all business development and the, and a lot of what a lot of young people would think is like the fun stuff, even though you, you have to have something to show for it, right? Like it's not just about taking people to dinner and golfing and on boating trips or surfing or whatever. Like you have to put meat on the table. Would you be able to do that job or do it as well if you didn't have the skill set? behind and the experience behind it. No, I think that that's what underpins everything that I do, right? Is that skill set, right? Having that background gives gives me a broader base of knowledge to draw upon. Like I know what it's like for the guy in the field. I was that guy, right? And so that's how we shape our company's culture is it's is we shape the culture around the internal customer which are our employees. Right. And so having that knowledge of what it's like to actually go and turn ranch or go and run service calls does give me a better understanding of, you know, what that means to be a plumber. Mm -hmm. So you were Ray in a truck. Yeah, and I was Ray somehow, in a truck. You, you know, fast, fast forward, you got to 65 guys, girls. So how did that happen? Like, at what point did you start to take more people on and did it ever just hit like a steep curve? Like when, when did you all of a sudden have to start hiring people, you know, left and right? And to be clear, you're a non-union shop, right? Yeah, we're a non-union shop. We are part of the ABC, the Associated Builders Contractors. Mm -hmm. So we do operate similar to a union shop, but, you know, it started pretty much right away within the first couple of years. And I think where the growth really accelerated was when a friend of mine and a mentor said, Hey, if you really want to grow this business, you've got to stop being an employee and start being a business owner, right? Because you are mm -hmm. still out in the field. He's like, I understand you love your job, which I do. He's like, but if you want to see this grow and create more opportunities for more people, then you've got to step out of the role of plumber and step into the role of president and business owner, right? And so one of the hardest things I have to do is stop driving the utility truck, right? And stop wearing work boots to work every day. And so doing that right there, it kind of, quote unquote, handicapped me into forcing me to get into the role of president, which I always found I found to be a little bit uncomfortable at first. And a lot of people who come from the field into management do find uncomfortable because like an imposter syndrome type deal. You, yeah, you get a little bit of imposter syndrome. And I think what it is, is now you're managing people and mm -hmm. people are emotional and they're unpredictable and everybody's a little bit different. And I always like to make the analogy, well, you know, in the field, when you're a field guy, if that pipe doesn't move, you just get a bigger pipe wrench, right? You get some, some leverage. Mm -hmm. If that ground's too tough, you get a bigger excavator. With people, it's mm -hmm. all soft skill, right? Those same principles don't apply. So you actually have to learn a new trade in your business, which is managing people. So you go from Ray in a truck to, you know, maybe it was three and then 10 and now 65. As you're growing that team, what's turnover been like? Have you been able to retain people, compensation, education, appreciation, opportunity? What is it that you find allows you to build a team and hold it so that the company keeps, you know, prospering? It is decentralized management. It is, give me one second, but it is trusting my, my team to do their jobs well. And it is investing in people. So we do a lot of education. We hold our apprenticeship classes here at our office. We're constantly sending people to classes either on the mainland or online. And I think when people recognize that the company is investing into them, into their future, right? We're trying to lift them up and improve their lives. They become incredibly loyal, right? They're like, wow, well, this, this guy or this company cares about you know, my future and wants to see me improve and is investing in me. And I'm happy to say, you know, our retention rate is over 90%. Typically, when people wow. leave the company, it's because they're leaving for the mainland because they have a parent who's aging, or they got married, we had somebody who was a, was started with us, 
zero experience, became a licensed journeyman and just moved back to Wisconsin because he met a gal who was also from Wisconsin and got married. So that's typically where our turnover occurs. And the cost of living here is really expensive as well. But you know, Hawaii, it's just, Hawaii to Wisconsin, Hawaii to Wisconsin, screw that. Why would you, you do know, that? It's, it's tough when, you know, a lot of, you know, coming to Hawaii, you know, people have this kind of, they put the rose colored lenses on, right? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's paradise. But when you don't have family here, you don't have roots here, it is a little bit harder to make it. You know, yeah, and especially sure. when you get married and you start raising children, you want the grandparents around. And that's usually where we've seen our turnover. But, you know, our retention rate, why it's so high is because we treat our our employees as the internal customer, right? And our leadership mm -hmm. is about servant leadership. How can we help our employees to, you know, gain more skill sets and whether that's soft skills or hard skills, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody's a little different, you know, sometimes people have to, you know, take their kids to work in the morning and being flexible and understanding with people that, you know, you're here to work with them to ultimately make sure that they are success. Yeah, you're you're there to serve your employees. They're not there to serve you. That's at least Correct. the mentality that you have, right? So now we all know all over the country, plumbers, I mean, they're, they're throwing bids out there for two to three times what they normally would because there's just, there's just no plumbers. Like even above all other trades, there's a shortage in plumbers. You're on an island in the middle of the friggin' Pacific Ocean. I can only imagine that it's even more competitive and in demand out there, or at least the supply is is shorter. What's what's compensation like for a journeyman plumber on the island? Non-union journeyman plumber. Average average salary is about one hundred fifty thousand a year for a journeyman plumber. I will tell you, prevailing wage right now is eighty five dollars an hour for the full pay package. You know, we pay about scale. Like total pay package is almost equal with prevailing wage. You know, with the amount of holidays and PTO that we give as well as other benefits. So that's about what the wage is. And it's, it ke keeps you in a decent living in Hawaii, which is one mm -hmm. of the most expensive places to live. But again, sure. if you want to retain good people, you got to pay them adequately so they can afford mm -hmm. to live here. So, you know, we pay it a couple of different ways. We have salary hourly, and then we have commission employees for our service techs, right. which require being on call. And service techs can be anywhere from 175 to 250 a year, depending on, you know, how much they work and what their skills are with, with selling and the types of jobs they're taking on. And it's not uncommon. Now as a service tech, yeah. is that like a hybrid salesperson slash journeyman? Like they're doing their own sales, but then also doing the service physically themselves? Correct. Usually they're going out to the client and they are diagnosing the problem. They are presenting the client with a couple of different solutions. They're doing the estimating and they are also doing performing the work. And what's the, what's an example? So I always tell people that MEP above all else is, is one of the things that or the disciplines that I would recommend you get into. One of the reasons being is because of the service work, right? Like in Florida, you always need HVAC. It's always going to be there. People always need to turn the lights on. What's service work and plumbing like? Like what, what, what would be an example of some scope that would be service work? Sure. We, so primarily we are business to business, but one of our service techs went out to a, a hotel. They had a backed up main that they kept trying to clear, found that it had apex where basically the pipe was doing this in the middle. Mm -hmm. So they estimated the cost of dig up. They coordinated with all the rentals. So they got the equipment out there. They got the barricades and the plywood out there. They performed the work, they dug it up and they found a banyan tree root had basically uplifted this pipe. They corrected it, backfilled, and then refinished the landscaping. And it took about uh, seven days, but they worked through the weekend because mm -hmm. there was an event happening on Monday for the hotel and they needed to get it done. A lot of what ser service yeah. work typically entails not knowing when the end of your day is going to be sometimes, right? Where you have a schedule of right. different calls you're going to be in. Sometimes that 12 o'clock call is a six hour call, right? Because you're dealing with either a complex that has no water or no sewer, or, you know, the job, you know, you start to take things apart and other things start falling apart as you're taking them apart. So sure. it was, what's nice about service work is every day is a new day and every call is different and you certainly right. don't get bored because, you know, and it's exciting. It's on your toes. You get to be the guy in the cape, right? Or the gal in the right. cape, right? You get to show up somewhere where somebody is a little bit distraught where their plumbing's not working or they got an active leak, you know, and they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. You get to be the person who gets to show up and solve it and be the hero. 
which was always the funnest part of the job, at least for me, was making people's days better because now their plumbing is working. I think, you know, greatly underestimated what a luxury we have in this country. Having clean water, like you said, believe it or not, plumbers save more lives than doctors do. First of all, a hospital couldn't run without clean water. You couldn't manufacture pharmaceuticals without clean water or food. Other countries, diarrhea is a serious problem. I think, I forget what country is in Africa, but I think in Africa in general, several thousand kids die every day because of diarrhea because they don't have clean water sources. So we don't realize the luxury that we have. And to be able to swoop when there's something wrong, you know it and it sucks. And to be able to swoop in as that superhero with that cape is incredible, right? But it also speaks to the value. It also speaks to why guys are making $85 an hour, you know, plus plus a package, right? Now, obviously you guys had a significant event when we talk about chaos and emergencies. Last year, we had a hurricane here that totally wiped out, you know, everything and we're going to be building back for 10 plus years. What's what's the state of the state where you're at in Hawaii? What's it been like? How's that affected, you know, Maui plumbing and your industry in general? Yeah, I mean, the August 8th fires, you know, it destroyed a historical town of Lahaina and it really destroyed a lot of our working class neighborhoods as well as businesses. So currently it's been 6 months since that happened. We are just beginning the cleanup phase. So every civil contractor I know is working overtime basically. Mm-hmm taking out the burn debris and putting into a temporary disposal site. We we're hoping that process lasts about a year, hopefully maybe less than two, but I've heard as long as three. And so once that happens, people can start to rebuild on their lots and the county is looking at expediting that. This is going to be a very complex situation because we lack the skilled trade workers necessary for the rebuilding efforts. Mm -hmm. Did a study and found that Maui would need to add about 2,500 additional construction workers to its workforce just for the rebuild efforts. And for context, right now we have 4,000 employed in construction on the island of Maui. So that's over a 50% increase that would need to happen just for that effort. And that doesn't include the amount of homes that we have to build that are our backlogged and the maintenance work on our existing buildings over 70 percent are over 40 years old so we've got aging infrastructure that also needs to get upgraded and repaired and so now when i spoke to you for the first i spoke with you for the first time seven eight months ago it was like right before that happened yeah you were telling me that hawaii was already in a tough situation with a uh, with a housing crisis shortage and like you said all the older buildings the infrastructure is subpar like it it needs work it needs to be replaced right so hawaii was already stretched before this happened yeah we were already stretched before it happened Um, you know our number of construction workers have flatlined for about the last 10 years at about thirty-two thousand. you know even especially with plumbers you know looking at the number of plumbers we've only grown the number of plumbers by less than two percent since 2004 you know and a lot of that has to do with the amount of retiring that's happening in the industry overall And the other issue is we have population decline happening in Hawaii where people are leaving because it's so expensive to leave, you know, and we get a lot of people that ask us, you know, especially since the fire happened, hey, we want to come out and help. You know, one of the problems is Hawaii is non-reciprocal for licensure. And the other problem is we don't have people where to house people if we did import labor from the mainland. So if we wanted to import those 2,500 workers, we would need to find 2,500 homes for those workers. Yeah. Or Um, or, or they're in a tent. (laughs) Yeah. We were supposed to build, the state said we were supposed to build 50,000 housing units by 2025. And that was in 2019. Mm -hmm. They did the study. We built 8,000 of those 50,000 units. A lot of that has to do with the lack of skilled workforce. So it's a precarious situation, one that's not going to get fixed anytime soon. But what I like to tell people coming into the trade is, yeah, this is going to be a challenge, but we get to be the heroes of this story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, man, you know, having seen the devastation that happened here firsthand, I can only imagine, you know, what you're going through. I I think I have a parallel image in my mind of what's going on. What's it like for young people there? Are are people not interested in the trades? Is there a push in school? Like what if I was if I was young in Hawaii and they followed my advice and they said, all right, go be a plumber. I mean, where do they go? What, what resources are out there for young people to pick up a trade? You know, that that is a problem. We're really bad at marketing our industry. And that's one thing I'm actively working to change. I'm part of a nonprofit group called the Construction Industry of Maui. And one of the things we did this year is we raised $70,000 to start vocational training in local high schools. 
So we're going to disperse that money through our five local high schools and we're going to start vocational training, basically the core class for construction. So it's carpentry, roofing, electrical, plumbing. And mm -hmm. what that's going to do is give students a good base of skills, like how to read a tape measure, what a two by four is and that kind of thing. And that what we found is if people, if kids can take a vocational training in high school, they're much more likely to join the trade after high school. And so right mm -hmm. now there's two career pathways. There's basically the union shops and there's the non-union shops. And everybody from union to non-union is actively recruiting. All you have to do is call or show up, but everybody has job openings available. You know, Hawaii's economy isn't very diverse. We have tourism. Yeah, basically, you know, we, mm -hmm. we survive off our looks and all the industries surrounding it. And so construction provides a good opportunity for local students to build a good career that's well paying that enables them to build a good life here on the islands where it is expensive to live and should they choose to leave which they we hope they don't but if they choose to leave they have a skill set that is valuable anywhere they go mm -hmm. yeah so not dumping on going to college you got to go to college for the right things and maybe it's mechanical engineering or something but i happen to notice because i compared colleges previously university of hawaii does not have the greatest return and i think when you talk about stimulating an economy and not having to leave because you can't afford it, you know, these are $85 an hour is, is good no matter what the cost of living is, right? So these are good opportunities for people without having to get a college education, right? It's a different education. It's paid for a different way. And, you know, you have no student loan debt thereafter. The second, other than, you know, paying for the education, the other objection or concern people have is how do I start? with no work experience. Getting exposure in high school is obviously a good thing to put on the resume to get the ball rolling, like you just said. But say you're, I don't know, 18 to 30, and you don't know what, you didn't know what you want to do, you want to know now, Maui Plumbing, how does one approach them with no work experience, but saying, hey, I want an opportunity, I don't even really know what a plumber does, I just know that I want to do it because they make decent money. Like, what would you say? to somebody what so advice just, do you have to approach you just come in right just just show up. yeah i mean if somebody shows the willingness to want to learn they show that tenacity and they they show up and they're motivated you know and they they come into our office and this has happened multiple times they come into our office ready to work where they got jeans on they got a boots on and they you know they've got proper attire and they're like hey you know i don't know anything but i really want to learn this trade and we've turned out four or five journeymen this year that came into our office just like that, where they didn't know anything, didn't know how to read a tape measure. And now two of them are running their own projects because it's, it's really just having that in less, in less than a year. It's been five years for them in less than okay. a year, in less than a year, you're basically a second year apprentice. Mm -hmm. You've gone through your core class and you're usually working with a foreman or journeyman and you are starting to actually perform work on your own. And, you know, it doesn't take long. And, you know, we've we've had guys because we're a merit shop that have accelerated super quickly because mm -hmm. they are always those yes people, always saying yes to extra work. You know, if one of their bosses says, hey, you know, I've got this other job over here. Can you go do that? And it's always a yes, right? So it's just it's just overall the willingness to want to learn and want to improve and want to do the actual work that's involved. You know, it's that famous quote, everything you've ever wanted is, is on the other side of the work you're not willing to do, right? So if you just right. take that step and are willing to do the work, I mean, you can be incredibly successful in this field. And do you have any other small pieces of advice for somebody? So like show up, talk is cheap, right? You say the right things, but then you're there. Other than saying yes, what are some physical things like the an example I'll give you? Like, don't be on your phone, right? Like, put your phone away, especially when you're working in the field. What other th is there anything else that you'd say to somebody when they're coming in? How do they shine? How do they give off the right perception? It's engagement, right? It's being engaged. So it's not being on your phone, right? It's not looking around. It's not spacing out. It's being engaged and asking questions and realizing there's no dumb questions when you're first starting, right? The only dumb question is the one you don't ask, because if you don't ask the question, that just remain, means you're going to remain ignorant. Right? So mm -hmm. asking questions and just remaining engaged and listening to the conversations that are happening around you and paying attention is, you know, people pick up on that immediately, especially your supervisors. You know, when we do annual reviews on people, it's one of the first things. How engaged are they? Right. Right. Get it, want it, have the capacity to do it, right? And getting it is all about just continual engagement. I say that we're a high engagement company. And if you don't, if you aren't highly engaged, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb.
because they do. So it's just that willingness to want to do the work and learn every day and ask your supervisors questions because they are willing to teach you, you know, if you want to learn. That's awesome. I like that. And I'm probably going to clip that because I think that's a, that's a, that's a good piece of advice. I mean, you just talk to so many kids and they struggle, you know, or they'll say like, oh, they didn't teach me anything or, you know, they didn't do this or they were mean to me or whatever. And it's like, okay, but did you give off the right perception that you were somebody that they wanted to invest the time in? A lot of these guys, they don't have time. You know, it's like Brett Favre versus Aaron Rodgers. Like he, he didn't feel like he meant he should have been his mentor, right? He wasn't his job. So a lot of the guys, they don't want to waste their time with somebody that doesn't give a crap, right? Yeah. Like they got their own job to do and their own, their own family to go home to, you know, that they're not like fighting to teach people things. So you want to create the right, the right perception for yourself. As far as starting your own business, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you'd, you would say, you know, if somebody came, if somebody wanted to go start their own business, you know, that works under you now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, stop them or try to sink them or anything like that. Most people say like, yeah, I love seeing people be successful. You know, that that's what that's what we're all here to do. So for somebody that is thinking that they want to get in this to start their own business, just like you did, what would you what would be some advice that you would give them? You know, always leave on good terms with your previous employer. You know, we've had a number, a couple of people leave to start their own business and they've always left on good terms. And, you know, mm -hmm. we still talk to this day and we offer, you know, they've come to us and ask us for to borrow things and we happily oblige. But, you know, realize that you're going to make mistakes I, and failure really is a great learning tool. And don't worry about it so much and just start, right? You know, there's never going to be an opportune time. You know, I started this business in 2010. That was the tail end of the 2008 recession. Probably not the greatest time to start a business if you asked, no. you know, quote unquote experts, but not the worst time either because you started in a lull and well, great, you know how to survive in that time period. But just, just take the leap, you know, and know that you can rely on yourself to make it happen. And it's just that high engagement again. You know, I remember when I first started, I didn't have a lot of business. So it was going around to different people and just cold calling them and just introducing myself, property managers, realtors, hospitality managers, and just having that high engagement. And, you know, one of the things is just always good communication, you know, always mm -hmm. returning clients, phone calls and emails in a very prompt manner that really, you know, shows people that, Hey, this, this person really cares about the work they do and about the clients that they serve. So I think that's it. It's mm -hmm. no, just, just get started. You know, there's never really the perfect time is not going to come know that you're going to fail. And it's about like that persistence and never quitting. Right. And good communication with your, your customers, your vendors and your employees. Yeah, it's not no business owner became successful because they hit up all green lights. And the difference is are the people that can survive, overcome, learn, improve. And that's what makes them a successful business. That's how you get from Ray in a truck to 65 people, Howie Plumbing, right? And and what to your point, communication is is key. You want to communicate professionally. Any kind of a small thing, whether it's a detailed proposal or a professional, you know, written email responsiveness right away. Just put yourself in, in those shoes when you when you have somebody working at your house or you want to hire somebody to do something. You don't want to wait for an update, right? Like you, you, you want to know that they're engaged and that you matter. So those are ways that you can that you can separate yourself from everybody else. Because believe it or not, this industry, the people that do that are far and few between. And it's a really easy way to separate yourself. So I'm glad you said that. Yeah. To your Ray, point about real quick about the professionally mm -hmm. written emails, that is something that some people who come from the field struggle with, mm -hmm. you know, they don't find it, you know, important to, you know, have proper sentence structure or paragraph spacing. And what I tell them is like, Hey, this is just an how your proposal looks and how you write your email is just as important as, as making sure hot is on the left and cold is on the right. And yeah. that everything is plumb and neat and level, right? Because this is, sure what we call a customer touch point. So they're going to see this and they're automatically going to make a judgment about the quality of your work based on the quality of your email or proposal. So make and sure I, to get that right. Put some time into it. I would say that there's a balance too, right? Like nobody wants to read a novel. So, <laughs> Succinctness right? so is important. Yeah. You want to be succinct, right? I, I, I'm pretty good at writing professional emails. I try to keep everything to bullet points, like well-structured bullet points, valuable information quick they can they can read it understand it digest it understand what action item they need to take away and go from there but you know communication is key and it's it's a big differentiator no matter where you go so ray 
Is there anything else? I, I, I always like to try to keep these short because I want people to be able to listen to them on the way to work. Is there anything else you'd like to share, whether it's opportunities you know, in Hawaii, anything else, any other advice that you have for anybody? The floor is yours. Yeah. you know, For those of you struggling to grow your business, I would say start to look outside of your industry for talented people because there's talented people everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, My operations manager and our vice president both actually came from manufacturing which is a similar industry to construction. If you think about it, construction, we do manufacture. We just build the one prototype the one time. But, you know, we have a number of people who came from the food service industry who were great customer service and now they're service techs because they came from that customer service background. They are very successful. Right. So looking outside your industry for talented individuals who may be better at you at certain things. Like I know my operations manager is much more organized and detailed than I am. And my vice president is much better at finance than I ever will be. So hiring people for the roles that are better at you than the role, and as well as looking Mm -hmm. outside your industry will really help you grow. That's incredible advice, especially since, I mean, people are just struggling. It's so competitive out there. And I think right down to the, to the education level, you know, the high school education level in junior high, you, you already said, we do a poor job at, at advertising this industry and the opportunities that are there. And I think for supervision, project managers, you know, a lot of us have requirements for college degrees. I'd love to take an 18 year old out of high school and stick them with me and get them on that path because I bet four years with me or four years in a trade and then hanging out with me, you know, would have them, you know, more than capable. It's really just about the attitude and your ability to communicate. I'd take anybody doing anything as long as they had the right attitude and they were able to communicate. So I think, I think that was yeah. very valuable. So again, at Maui underscore plumbing. Yep. Go follow them on Instagram. I'm going to share some of their stuff. Again, b- beautiful scenery, if nothing else, if you want to see what a tradesman looks like in, in paradise, it's good for that. And I just, I'm very impressed with everything that Ray has been able to build, especially coming from, you know, just him in a truck. And I think everybody can, can learn for him. So learn from him. So keep an eye on him. Ray, I appreciate you coming on and sharing, you know, everything that you had to offer. Thank you. Yeah. I thank you so much for everything you're doing for the industry and rupturing those stereotypes about our industry and getting people excited about it. I love your content. So thank you for that. Appreciate that, man. Thank you again, guys. You can follow me at the construction mentor on Instagram, TikTok, TikTok, and YouTube. Go check out the website, constructionmentor.org. I have technology key. I'm sure Ray has as his uh, software that he runs his business with, which we didn't touch on. But if you're, if you don't have the money to invest in that software and you're starting your own business, I have project management templates, invoicing, AIA invoicing, any kind of logs to track work, RFIs, submittals, things like that. I have all that stuff on my website. This month I am uploading a HVAC introduction to HVAC course. So be on the lookout for that. I'm editing the videos now and just continue to follow. I'm going to keep putting content out there to help everybody. I want to see everybody take advantage of these opportunities. I want to see the industry grow. And I want to see success for people and individually in their own life. So again, Ray, thank you. I appreciate it. And I will.